Hello, uh, we are in our second to last section. Um, I will send out here shortly, um, probably while this is uploading and rendering <clears throat> on YouTube, I will send out uh, the guided notes for the section on Mexico, as well as the assignment that will be due on May 15th. Um, and I'll say that in the email. So please follow through on that. Um, uh, so this starts that. We'll, we'll do the a module today on Mexico, uh, Monday and Wednesday next week, then Friday next week, which is the 15th, is when the assignment is due. Now, uh, I just want to be clear, the district as a whole is not having anything new post the 15th assigned to students, right? That's the mentality. Um, that is new. Uh, so there's a weird semantics or wordplay here. We have our last test, Unit 3 test, uh, currently scheduled for May 27th. Um, so it's the, geez, I guess it's the Wednesday after Memorial Day. Um, that we'll just cover, just like we've done before. This is an accumulative test. This test will be on Mexico and on Britain, and that's it. We'll do a review and make sure everybody's ready for it, probably on that Tuesday. Um, I'd imagine I'll do the review and upload it so you guys are ready for it. So just some housekeeping, that's where we're going as a class. Uh, let's see, on top of that, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I need to be aware of for you. Yes, the actual tests that were turned in. Um, I'm about halfway through grading all of them. Uh, you know, it usually takes me about like a week to get everybody's graded and, and put into power school. Um, the most common thing I'm seeing on the World Civ tests, uh, they have been better than the first units, which is expected because you know my formatting, you know what I'm looking for. Um, the one mistake I'm seeing, which is fewer times than the first test, is the, the name dropping, if you will, meaning like putting in the names of leaders in the actual essays. Uh, I'm seeing Tiananmen Square put in there most commonly, but beyond that, those kids who are missing getting like a 40 out of 50 if you're like what happened and if I write like I needed more leaders in the free response that's it I mean you guys really um, have gotten in the groove of how I test so kudos to you in that uh, better overall average so far than I saw first unit but that's the one sticking point that I'm seeing in the test and uh, yeah I think I think that's it so what I'd like to do uh, today is uh, two things. I want to I want to go over on your notes. You'll see uh, before we get into political parties. You know that's the first section that we'll do, and we'll try to get through that today. At the top in the margins, um, I do want to show you a couple of the leaders and uh, names with faces as we refer back to them. Right, getting you ready for the test. <clears throat> um, so that's our that's our plan. Uh, yeah. So I need to get the pictures. They're just right on this desk over here. One second. Right. Okay, so uh, let's go over these Mexican leaders, and I will try to cover them in order so that they'll help. Mm, yeah, okay. Let's first talk about, this is not specifically a leader I want you to know about, but this is uh, a member of a group called the Zapatistas. Zapatistas, Z-A-P-A-T-A, -A -A, uh, Zapatistas. T-I-S-T-A, yeah, Zapatista. Um, this is a member of the Zapatista uh, National Liberation Front, which we'll talk about later. Um, this group was important in the 90s, in the 90s, in southern Mexico and Chiapas. In fact, we had a student teacher here at Green Canyon this past trimester who went down to student teach in Chiapas, which shows some courage on her part, because it's it's a little bit of a scary place um, because the Zapatistas have controlled a lot. Okay, so Zapatistas, Zapatistas. Okay, the next leader that I want you guys to know about is he was the first PAN president. Okay, that's the acronym. I know a lot of you are like, it's Spanish, it's bread. He's the first bread president. Not really, I'm talking about the acronym PAN, which we'll get to. He was the first president. His name is Vicente 
Fox. If you just remember Fox, F-O-X, you're golden. Fox. He served in 2000 uh, until about 2006. And he was the first PAN president. It was a big moment because it's almost, it's almost, geez, it's almost like if Democrats had won every single presidential election through the whole 20th century. So from 19... You know, 01 all the way to 2000 or whatever. Um, uh, that, to, to me, that's the seminal moment when the PAN beat the other party, or in this case, the Republicans finally won an election. That's huge. That's huge. It shows political competition, which some of you talked about in your papers from before. Um, so he's important. They have six year terms. Now we're going to, there was another guy, Felipe Calvert. Calderon, we don't need to know about him. Um, but then in 2012, uh, there was this guy who won. He was the PRI, which is like the dominant party for a long time. His name was Peña Nieto, like two words, if you will, for the last name. P-E-N-A space N-I-E-T-O. If you can remember Nieto, you're golden. So Nieto and Fox. And he, he's important because he showed, like, the PRI woo, rose from the grave and, and came back. And, and that's why he's important. All right. And then the current president who, uh, doing the math, is their six-year presidential terms in 2018. Um, the president who really, like, commandeered the third lesser-known party and then made it his own. Um, it's almost like if Mitt Romney were to take, like, the Constitution Party, which is a real party in the U.S., and to call it like the Mitt Romney party and win, right? That's, that's what it would take. This guy here, his name is Obrador. Obrador. So O-B-R-A, uh, O-B-R-A-D-O-R, Obrador. Yep, Obrador. He um, is the current president, uh, and he, as you'll find out, was the leader of like a new party that was an old party and and he is for workers we'll get to him in a second um, but those are the leaders so i hope that helps out <clears throat> with knowing about those leaders okay now under political parties in this section there's going to be a total of uh four yeah four total things you're going to write down in this section the first thing is really a diagram okay that i want you to write down uh, it's almost like a number line, if you guys have seen that with like math, where it's like, um, you know, negative one, zero, one, right? Like that's sort of what we're, we're trying to do. I want you just to write like a little number line, like a little line. And on this diagram, we're going to talk about three main parties, okay? So on the right-hand side of the page, as you're looking down, you're going to write down on that side of the diagram, uh, the, the acronym, the, the initials of the one party called P-A-N, P-A-N. Okay, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write down on the opposite end, so like on the right side of the diagram, the right-hand side is going to be P-A-N, and not the bread party, something else. And then you're gonna write something on the left side of the diagram uh, with the initials P R D, P R D. Okay. And we'll define them all in a second. Now, I mean, like, that's their diagram. They have a right handed party, if you will, and a left handed party. Now, the reason why they call it that in political spectrum, a lot of times right leaning parties, and we're covering Mexico, so it helps you cover the US a little bit because they have some overlap. Most countries in the world refer to the right end of the spectrum as being conservative, traditional values. Um, that they they uh, definitely want to keep tradition. They don't want to change things up too much. And uh, in in the Mexican and U.S. sense, it also means usually less government power. Right? They want more power in the people's hands, and not as much government regulation. On the left side of the spectrum is what you might see as being liberal or left wing, and that means they doesn't mean they want to like kill people just because they want government control. They might want to do it for the right reasons, but it's on the left-hand side. And that left-hand side uh, means they want more regulation, more involvement to help people out, right? So that's what we would call Democrats. And, and on the right-hand side, uh, Jada, 
that means their PAN party is really what we would think of as ding 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 Republicans. Um, all right, so then I mentioned though there's a third party. This third party, I don't want you like, so you have PAN, you have PRD, I don't want you to even have it on that spectrum. I want it to be like below it or some way that you know like they're not even on the spectrum. They're, they're so far off there, it's almost like, okay, so we're gonna have a spectrum of all the different fruits that are in the produce aisle. So we have apples to oranges and that's our little produce line. And then like you have steak, like it's totally different. It's a totally different political party. That party's name is PRI. PRI. So you have PAN, PRD, PRI. So those are the three parties that you're dealing with there. All right, so we have that first thing written down. And we'll probably come back to that um, uh, toward the end here. Let's define these parties, okay? Uh, the second thing you're going to write down here in this section is PAN. And let's define it. This is defined as, I may know what the acronym stands for, maybe from the reading. Ooh, Ellie, maybe, no. National Action Party. Now, I know as you're writing this down, you're like, Pierre, this doesn't make sense at all. It's flipped around because it's in Espanol, right? Like in Spanish, they usually are flipped. It's not like blue car, it's car blue, if you will. So um, the actual party acronym that's known by is PAN. Translated into English, it's National Action Party. Okay. Um, National Action Party was founded in 1939 and is the oldest opposition party to the PRI. Founded in 1939 and is the oldest opposition party to the PRI. Um, private business leaders and Catholic church leaders formed this party to take away control from the PRI. Okay, so private business leaders and Catholic church leaders form this party to take away control from the PRI. Wow, whoa, this is a unique stance and I, I wish in a way that Russia had this. So when I say private business leaders, I, again, I wish I had some feedback here. What do you guys think that would be? Caleb, any thoughts? Yeah, they're business owners, people who are not employed by the government, who are making their own profit and creating their own business, cleaning businesses, uh, sanitation. I guess that's what's on my mind with COVID right now restaurant owners and stuff like that. Those are private business owners um, making a product, service, sales, whatever. Okay, private business leaders and Catholic church leaders form this party. So you've written that down. Wow, why would Catholic church leaders like jump in on this? Um, some might look at that and say, wow, in the U.S. we have separation of church and state. Religion doesn't get involved at all. That's, that's true. But imagine if you had, again, in that analogy of like a hundred years of one party control and that party persecuted all of Protestant churches including the Latter-day Saint Church repeatedly, right? Imagine that happened all the time. Um, Christianity as a whole would rise up and try to defend itself and join with whoever the, uh, with whomever they could to fight against the, the strong government that is there. That's what happened in, um, in Mexico. So in the 30s, a after a very bloody rebellion, which you don't even know about, called the Cristero Rebellion, whoa, it was bad. You had hundreds of thousands of Catholic people being killed by the government because to this day, well, for a long time, Catholic church leaders have not had a right to vote. And the reason why, well, you tell me, why would the PRI, which controlled the government, which was the government, why were they so sketchy and feeling insecure about the Catholic church? Well, yeah, it's another source of power. So if I were to tell you a directive as a teacher and then Dave Swenson were to come and tell you something, if I were insecure, I'd be like, well, get out of here, I don't trust you, and I'd push you out, right? That's the government, the PRI, pushing um, the Catholic Church out and making them where they can't vote, you can't talk to them. Uh, it's like the insecure ex-boyfriend or boyfriend type thing. I don't want you talking, I don't want you being around those people. Um, because those people might have ideas and make you start thinking creatively and independently, and we don't want that. Um, so, with that said, uh, uh, PRI was opposed by these leaders. So, if it's, if it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Baptists and Episcopalians, if they were all to come together to fight against one main party in the U.S., then that, that could happen. 
The reason I say I wish Russia would have this is Russia had um, atheism, being agnostic even as a stretch is different for their culture. Atheism is like a big push in their culture. To have another group that people would congregate and go to might help prevent like tyrannical leaders because it's a check and a balance in a way. So um, you have here that PAN is formed by those two groups and I hope that makes sense as to why they would. It's not a matter of like, and we're going to give you religion. It's just they don't want a government telling them they can't worship at all, which is what was happening. Uh, okay, keep writing here uh, under PAN and that is, let's talk about what they believe in. So I think you have an idea. Of, We've talked about the Republican analogy, but you can say this party believes in regional autonomy. Regional autonomy, and they want less government control in the economy. They want regional autonomy and less government control in the economy. Less is more. So. Um, this group believes in autonomy. We've alluded to this before, autonomy. What does autonomy mean? Think of the word auto. We're like Autobots, right? Self-controlling, automobile, self-starting, self-going internal combustion engine. It just goes on its own. It's a robot, whatever. Um, autonomy means you have self-control. You rule yourself. So as a student living at home, you probably don't have a ton of autonomy, but you probably have more autonomy, I hope, now than you did when you were like six, right? Your parents probably had more control over you then than they uh, do now. They want more of it. Those in the PAN say, government, Mexico City, just get out of our lives. And they also say, don't control the economy. Let us like risk reward. Let's make products. I don't. If I'm making money, government, I don't want you coming in and taking money. So they want fewer taxes, all that stuff. So for five non-existent points, <laughs> this party is very similar to what party here in the U.S. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, Kayla, that is correct. Uh, very similar to the party that is known as the Republicans. So that's the last part that you put in. The second thing is this is the Mexican Republican Party, right? Okay. Um, don't, you, know, you don't need to really write this down, but as a reminder, Vicente Fox, he was a member of the PAN party. And a lot of you might think, well, then, therefore, he's a big fan of President Trump. No, 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 no. This is the Mexican Republican Party. It's not meaning like they're playing favorites. Vicente Fox and George W. Bush did get along pretty well. But President Trump, especially with immigration policies, like you can see Fox's Twitter feed, like he is always lambasting and just roasting, um, eviscerating President Trump on immigration issues. They don't, they don't get along on that for understandable reasons. So they're not complete chums. Okay, the third thing you're going to write down in this section is PRD, right? We're going to define this. It's a backwards acronym, right? For us, stands for Democratic Revolutionary Party. Democratic Revolutionary Party. Okay, PRD, Democratic Revolutionary Party, uh, emphasizes government control, but not to subjugate the people. They emphasize government control, but not to subjugate the people. S-U-B-J-U-G-A-T-E, subjugate. Okay, so what does the word subjugate mean? Anybody out there? Blake, anybody? Subjugate. Yes. <laughs> it means to put control over, to domineer over, uh, to oppress, repress, that type of thing. I mean, government, by any stretch of the definition, shouldn't be doing that. They might have more control than others, but not subjugating the people, not putting them in slavery-ish ways. Okay, so that's what we're looking about for subjugate. Um, keep writing here. If they want government control, but not to subjugate the people, what, are, what types of things are they looking for? What are examples of a government stepping in and helping you out? Any any thoughts? Right. So let's keep writing them. Government health care. Government health care. Social welfare. And other populist ideas. Okay? So government health care, social welfare, and other populist. Uh, like the word popular. P-O-P-U-L-I-S-T. Ideas. Health care social welfare and other populist ideas. Okay, so, I mean, they believe in a lot of things, but we're just being very generic. 
tax breaks, well not tax breaks, that's not the right example, uh, government programs, welfare checks, food programs, food stamps, government health care, helping out with education. These ideas, uh, I'm not saying like Bernie Sanders ideas, but sort of like Bernie Sanders ideas. Like if we can raise the taxes, we can use that then to help pay for other uh, services to help people out, right? We can spread the wealth in a way. Um, this idea from the PRD is, is that when I say populist, this is where PRD has gotten in trouble before. Um, and, and a lot of parties have. Populist means, if you want to write in the margins, uh, whatever the people want, right? So if I were a populist physical trainer, I would go to the gym and say, all right, Samantha, let's, let's start working out. And then she says, oh, God, God, but Gordon, I don't want to work out. I say, you know what, you're right. Let me go get you a box of donuts. I'll be back in five. Um, that's a populist physical trainer. Uh, it might feel good in the moment, but long term it defeats the purpose of what you're doing. So sometimes you need government officials to think big picture uh, and, and look beyond what we want. Meaning, well, as a leader, you might not have as many principles. You're just going exactly with what the people want. Bill Clinton's had that. Trump's had that. Both sides of the aisle have had that, where they go really with what the people want. And that might sound good, like, yeah, we're a democracy. That's debatable. But in doing that, you don't save the people from themselves because they might be choosing the donuts, so to speak, as opposed to you know, uh, more intense working out. <laughs> um, that's what populist means, whatever the people want. That's a, a tricky part. Okay, uh, keep writing here for PRD. This party has been in disarray because they aren't organized like the business leaders of the PAN. They aren't organized like the business leaders of the PAN. Until Obrador. Until Obrador, right? That's important. So this party's usually been just like disorganized. So it's on the left side of the spectrum, and it's a bunch of you know college-age students and stuff like that, um, and they they haven't been as organized because you're not. You tell me who's going to be more efficient about getting tasks done: business leaders or a bunch of college kids? Usually business leaders. This is more like pie in the sky ideas, like let's help people out, let's be all good, um, and. Uh, and that's what they did in the PRD. And and they've, they've not had a lot of success. They've been there. They've had seats and stuff. Um, but they haven't won the presidency. And until Obrador, he took that party of the ideas and like made it sort of his own. And that's what they are now. They're not really known as a PRD. It's like their own Obrador party, if you will. Like it's there. Okay. Um, the last thing you're going to write down here is PRI. It's the Institutionalized Revolutionary Party, or Institutional Revolutionary Party, so PRI. And the reason they call it that is from 1917 on, like 1911-ish on, when that constitution was drafted, like it stuck there. That's exactly what it was, and it didn't go anywhere. Like that group was cemented into the country as being like the only ruling class. These generalissimos, these generals all came together and they formed the PRI and they're like, how can we just like hand power off to one another? And that's what they did for almost 100 years. It was intense, it wasn't competitive until 2000 when PAN actually beat them. Okay, so you wanna keep writing here that it has traditionally preyed upon, like predator and prey, preyed upon illiterate farmers who will vote for the PRI in exchange for favors. It has traditionally preyed upon illiterate farmers who will vote for the PRI in exchange for favors. Okay, you wanna keep writing here that Amer Indians, which comprise 30% of the population, usually vote for the PRI. Preyed upon, or preyed on illiterate farmers who vote for the PRI in exchange for favors. Amer Indians usually um, vote for the PRI. Their most recent president was President Nieto. All right. So he served from 2012 to 2018. Controversial guy uh, in that PRI came back, but I guess when all was said and done, aside from the Pemex, which is their main gas station thing, he, he wasn't seen as like as horrible of a leader as he could have been. He just he was a good looking face who didn't maybe has as much charisma. Uh, they have like their 
national independence celebration and he was like viva la revolucion like he was really low key and people made fun of him for that um, but PRI does exist it won in 2012 and, had, and won a lot more seats in their um, in their their congress uh, okay so they what's their stance the reason I don't even have them on the actual spectrum is their stance is they want to be in power you know whether it's the right side or left side they want to be in power so how did they get in power in 2012 some said it was through bribery some says that people forgot about their um, like hundred year reign of terror sort of um, that the younger people said oh that's a good-looking guy I'll vote for him um, you know it's sort of like a telenovela star like a soap opera star and they thought yeah like we're gonna vote for him so those are some of the reasons why they got power back but they don't really fall either side of the spectrum they're just there to get power and they have traditionally even to this day like a lot of in the southern states like Oaxaca Chiapas they will get uh, favors like they'll get beans rice or whatever and like it's expected wink wink no no it's like you're gonna vote for the PRI when election time comes so if about a third of the population traditionally votes for him and if they can get like swing the other votes through either corruption or other ways then they can um, they can uh, they can find success that way okay so that's the plan uh, for those three parties at the top there you don't have to write this down but I mean it might be by the diagram to show like who votes for these parties so PRD we've already talked about it. it's like younger college-age kids urban in Mexico City like you're living in the cities you're open to new ideas you're seeing different ideas and you might not be earning as much you want more government help uh, PAN you're living up north, away from Mexico City. A lot of the maquiladoras, like those uh, uh, manufacturing districts on the border, will vote um, for PN because they, they want less government intervention. Um, these are businessmen, church leaders, middle-aged, uh, middle-class type workers. And PRI, rural, um, like illiterate farmers, Amer Indians. Uh, and not all Amer Indians are illiterate, you know, farmers. That's, that's a too broad of a stroke. But you have the mestizos, which are the um, traditionally when you see somebody from Mexico, you're like, oh, like okay, the mix of European and Amer Indian indigenous peoples. Amer Indian is like the, the Native American equivalent, uh, Mayan and descendants, etc. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Um, with that said, I think that's it for today. We're going to stop there. Uh, we'll get back into Zapatistas next time and, uh, and some of the people characteristics and so forth. That's a lot. I hope that helps. Okay, thanks. Bye.